Welcome back to another week here in the Pioneer Sideline. We have a lot going on this week on the Sideline. Our reporters will talk about the big games that the baseball and softball team play this week. We'll also head to the track for some coverage on that. Also, we'll be doing a Pioneer Sideline mock draft. And as always, we'll finish up with the case of the week. So, it's time to head on down to the Pioneer Sideline. Welcome to the Pioneer Sideline. I'm your host, Kyle Anthony. The Point Park baseball team is trying to wrap up a regular season title. I'm going to send it over to Paul Daniels to see if the team is able to get any closer. So, Paul, take it away. Thanks, Kyle. The Pioneers baseball team had to postpone two home games against Milligan and Ohio Christian early last week due to the possible threat of rain and rough field conditions. They will make up the Ohio Christian game on April 16th at 2 p.m., and the other one is still yet to be determined. They remained at number 21 in the late, latest NAIA poll rankings and played in just their third home game on the season over the weekend against KIAC rival Brescia. Pitching led the way again for the Point Park in the first doubleheader on Saturday. Spone grabbed his 20th career victory on the mound and struck out six, only giving up two runs. Krivijanski gave up only one run and two hits in a pitching duel in the nightcap. The Pioneers supplied a bunch of offense in the first game with two four-run innings in the second and fourth to win the game 9-2. Andy Chacon and Demetrius Moore both had two hits in that one, and in the nightcap, the offense really didn't click, but that did not matter for Krivijanski. As he shut out Brescia through the first four innings, he went on to pitch two more, and Point Park held on to win 2-1 to one, with Jay Carreau picking up his sixth save on the season. Jason Kim continued that good pitching trend in the second doubleheader matchup. Kim pitched a complete game and only allowed one run in the effort, which again led the Pioneers to victory 2-1. to one. In the nightcap, the story was good pitching by both teams early on until Point Park was able to get into the bullpen in the fifth and drove in six runs. Haru Russo and Stefan Kanja all had contributed two hits apiece and Point Park completed the four-game sweep to improve to 29-6 overall and 14-2 in KIAC play. They still have seven more games in the regular season before the big KIAC tournament in a couple weeks. Now, Paul, how big was this weekend for the team? Oh, it's huge whenever you play uh, within the conference and are able to get a sweep, never mind take the series. It's always big for uh, the team, and, you know, this, this is a really good team standing tall in the KIAC so far. Now, how big is that that the team has scored a bunch of runs the past couple games? Oh, yeah, they, they scored some runs, and then they had some off days uh, in between. But it's okay because the pitching is right there for them. I, I looked at some of the stats today, and four of, the, four of the five stars, I believe, had a three ERA or lower. So that's very impressive for a pitching crew. You always have a chance. Now, Paul, is this team's greatest challenge itself? Uh, it, it's really going to depend on uh, if, if the pitching remains solid. Um, I think they'll always put themselves in an opportunity to, to take the win. But it depends uh, on the matchup, really. And it, Point Park has proven all season that, given the, given the opportunity, they can, they can beat anyone. Thanks, Paul. The softball team is trying to win a title themselves. So I'm going to ask Trevor Sheets how the journey is going. So Trevor, how's the softball team doing? Well, Kyle, with the doubleheader at Seton Hill last week being postponed due to weather, the Point Park softball team had eight days off before they hosted the first place IU Southeast Grenadiers last Friday and Saturday at Fairhaven Park. The Friday game saw IU Southeast take the first game by a score of 5-2. The Grenadiers got the scoring started early with three runs scored in the first two innings. Point Park got within one run when Karen Mao hit a two-run homer in the sixth to make the score 3-2. But IU Southeast put the game away in the next half inning with another two spot. The second game saw a dominant performance by the Pioneers, winning the game 8 to nothing in five innings. Two runs were scored early by Point Park, taking advantage of two IU Southeast errors. That was all the run support the Pioneers pitcher excuse me, Hannah Harley would need, 
Harley pitched a complete game, one hit shutout, allowing two walks and striking out three. Point Park added six more runs to have the game called after the fifth. On Saturday, the Pioneers again lost the first game, this time by a score of 6-5. to five. The Pioneers were the ones to strike early, scoring three runs in the first two innings with home runs from Karen Mao and Nally Zivic. Pioneer starter Kate Reese held IU Southeast scoreless until the fourth inning when the Grenadiers scored three to tie the game. Another three runs were scored by IU Southeast in the top of the six to take a 6-3 to three lead. The Pioneers pulled back within one when Alyssa McMurtry hit a two-run home run in the bottom of the sixth, but that was all the offense the Pioneers could muster, losing by one. Point Park was able to take the second game, though, scoring eight runs again, winning the final game 8-5. to five. Point Park once again got the scoring starter early, getting four runs in the first three innings. Natalie Zivic's sack fly in the fifth gave Point Park a 5-1 to one lead, but the Grenadiers came back in the top of the sixth to tie the game at five, scoring four runs off of Hannah Harley, only two of them earned after three errors were committed by the Pioneers in the inning. The Pioneers won the game in the bottom of the seventh in dramatic fashion with a three-run walk-off home run by Alyssa McMurtry. Point Park still sits in, the th in third in the KIAC with a 22-14 overall record, 17-7 in conference. One game behind both Rio, Rio Grande and IU Southeast. Now, Trevor, what's the keys, keys to victory for this team? The team really just needs to play within themselves. Their big issue with IU Southeast that I saw for the most part was errors, and those errors came back to bite them continually, leading to runs that, as, um, especially in that last game, brought them back to tie before the uh, heroics in the seventh inning. Now, Trevor, what have the shortcomings been to this team? Once again, it's been, uh, well, fielding is a major problem, uh, as well as consistent pitching. Uh, Hannah Harley has been their best pitcher far and away. Kate Reese has had her moments, but they just, they haven't got enough consistent pitching to really allow the, the bats that have been doing a good job for them to consistently keep them, they've been keeping them in games, but haven't been able to push them over the edge. Now, do you see their game going up to end of the season, or do you see them just kind of staying right in the middle? I mean, in terms of moving up in the KIAC standings, I don't see that happening. I think they're probably going to stay in third. They, uh, they have Midway coming up this weekend, who, um, who they are better than and should be able to t hopefully take three of four in um, the back-to-back doubleheaders, but I don't see them moving up in the KIAC. Thanks, Trevor. When we return from break, we'll be going around the track, and then we'll head out to the course. All that and more when we return to the Pioneer Sideline. Start your morning with City News. Start your morning with Campus News. Start your morning with political coverage. Start your morning with fun. Start your morning with us, only on Daybreak. Did you know that Point Park has a cheerleading squad? Don't stop. Don't get it confused. Not only do our cheerleaders represent Point Park at regional and national competitions, but they also promote spirit and awareness of every sports team on campus. Come to any men's or women's varsity basketball game at home to watch the cheerleaders perform at halftime and cheer from the sidelines from the first jump ball to the final buzzer. Sports not your thing? You can catch the cheer team lead the crowd at the fall and spring pep rallies as well, or at several competitions around Pittsburgh each year. So what are you waiting for? Show the Point Park cheerleaders the support they show you. We know you're wondering what the A-list celebrities are up to. Well, here at Entertainment on Point, we're wondering too. Have you heard about James Franco and Seth Rogen's new movie? No, but have you heard Beyonce's new single? Did you see what she was wearing on that red carpet? Mm-mm, honey, that was not cute. Did you see what happened on Scandal this week? Uh -huh. No, I was too busy keeping up with the Kardashians. No matter what your guilty pleasure is, we've got you covered. Entertainment on point. Get, Get to, to the, the point, point of pop culture. culture. Yeah! <laughs> Back to the Pioneer Sodland. The track and field team has been breaking more and more records each meet they have. So our reporter Blaine King has a story. So Blaine, what records have they broken this week? Thanks, Kyle. While both Point Park's men and women's track and field teams competed at the Westminster Invitational on Saturday, April 11th. In this Invitational, the women set quite a few records. The number of records they set to be exact was 12. There were many highlights from this meet. One highlight was Katie Garnaccia, who came in first place in two events, the 1,500-meter run and the 5,000-meter run. She won the 1,500 meter in a time of four minutes and 58 seconds. And she won the 5,000 meter 
by a time of 40, uh, by 46 seconds, and she clocked in at 17 minutes and 58 seconds. Both of these times were school records as well, and Garnaccia's time in the 5,000 meter run was a top 20 time in the NAIA this year. Bianca Cotton finished third and set the school record in the triple jump with a leap of 10.43 meters. And Diaka Adams-Peterson placed sixth in the high jump with a jump height of 1.45 meters, which also was a school record. Other setting records on this day was Amber Brown in the 100 and 200 meter dashes, Vanessa Sperato in the shot put and, and discus, and Jania uh, McAllister in the 100 and 200 meter hurdles and Kelsey Wilkins in the 800 meter run overall. Overall, the women uh, were able to put, score 32 points and place 10th out of 22 teams. On the men's side of things, seven school records were set. Sean Barry broke his own school record in the high jump with a jump height of 1.9 meters, which was good enough for third. He also placed sixth in the triple jump with a leap of 12.71 meters. Dry Davis placed fourth in the triple jump with a leap of 13.06 meters. Josh Wright and Michael Beavis also set school records in the discus and shot put. And the discus, Wright had tossed a toss excuse me, of 33.36 meters. And in the shot put, Beavis had a toss of 10.32 meters. DeAnthony Morgan set the school record in the 200 meter dash as well. Chris Hunt set the school record in the 800 meter run and the men also set school records in the 4 by 400 meter relay. They were able to finish with 19 points, placing them 13th out of 20 teams. Both teams' next meet is Saturday, April 18th at the Slippery Rock Dave Labor Invitational. Now, Blaine, how is it that this team is breaking so many records? Well, it's pretty impressive because we see every week that they're breaking a new, that they're actually setting quite a few school records. Last week they set about six. This week you saw the women, they set 12 records and the men play se uh, set seven records. So it's pretty good continuity coming out of both of these teams. Now, Blaine, does it help that a lot of these runners also run cross country? It does because it gives them, it gives them fr uh, more energy in their legs. So they can, uh, they're, so they're used to kind of the long distance runs, and it also helps out to, for the runners. And but you're also seeing some from the uh, the throwing, the throwing competitions, and they really don't get any any work until the winter. So it's pretty, it's pretty important. Now, Blaine, what are some challenges of running track in the heat? Well, one thing is the heat for a fact, because when the heat, when it settles on you, you st when you're running all out, you start to get fatigued a little more, and you're going to need water. So right now, with the weather being kind of pretty uh, grateful for the pioneers, the heat hasn't been such a factor, but I look for it to be a factor going into later in the season. Thanks, Blaine. The Point Park golf team has always been a good program, so I'm going to bring Paul Daniels back to talk about the team. So, Paul, take us to the course. Thanks, Kyle. The men's team played in the Edward Jones shootout over the weekend and posted a 304 total after the first round. This put the team in solo second place and in good position for a top three finish. The senior Colin Holmes led the way after day one for the Pioneers shooting a 74, four over par performance. The tournament was hosted by Carnegie Mellon and played at the Lynx at Spring Church. In the second round, the Point Park shot their best round of the spring season with a 300 total. All five of their starters shot in the 70s on Sunday. They ended up finishing in third place, and Colin Holmes earned a tie for seventh individually with a total of nine over par for the tournament. St. Vincent beat out Point Park for second place by one stroke with a 298 team total in the second round. Carnegie Mellon won the tournament by a landslide by 20 strokes, posting a team total of 583. Point Park also had three of the top five individual best second round scores of the tournament, after that, they look ahead to the KIAC tournament coming up in about 10 days. On the women's side, they competed in their first tournament of the spring season and put up a decent showing, placing fourth of eight, eight teams at the Westminster Invitational at Newcastle Country Club. Emily Slifka was a standout performer for the Pioneers, shooting an 89 on the day. The team shot an overall score of 383 and was one stroke away from tying for third with Clarion. Just like the men's tournament, Carnegie Mellon won this title as well, with a team score of 370. 
Now Point Park looks ahead to the KIAC tournament later this week on the women's side. Now, Paul, what's the key to a good short game? Well, the key to a good short game is it's really just uh, mental strength and, and getting out there and, and, and competing with a bunch of reps. It's, that's, that's the key to a good short game. If you practice your putting and your chipping, you're always going to do well out in tournaments. Now, how do you get the most effective drive possible? <laughs> most effective drive? Easier said than done, Kyle, because uh, there's a lot of things mechanic-wise that goes into a swing. Um, first, you've got to feel uh, and, and have a good driver that you feel comfortable with and then go from there, but it really comes down to the mechanics of your swing. Thanks, Paul. When we get back on the sideline, I'll be putting my GM cap on and we'll be doing some drafting when we get back on the Pioneer sideline. Here at the Pioneer sideline, we get freshmen involved as quickly as possible so they get the real world experience on air and behind the scenes to set themselves apart in internships and potential jobs. Blaine, where is that video? I needed it in Key Pro like yesterday. All right, I got you, Chris. But I had a quick question for you guys. What do you mean a question? Like, it's always a question. The, uh, it's always a... What? Where is it? Blaine. 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 Freshmen, you can't find any good ones anymore. Ever wanted to be behind the mic and have the world listening to your show on campus? Well, it's just as simple as joining WPPJ, Point Park's student-run radio station, located on the second floor of Lawrence Hall, right next to the dining services. Listeners can tune in using Point Park's website or through the TuneIn app by searching WPPJ. WPPJ welcomes any new DJs that want to get involved, so be heard. Do you have what it takes? Welcome back to the Pioneer Sideline. It's my turn to play Todd McShay and Mel Kuyper. I'm joined by Tyler Jeske and Tyler Cahill, but first, here's my top 10. First pick, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers will take quarterback Jameis Winston from Florida State. Second pick, Tennessee Titans will select Leonard Williams from the University of Southern Cal. Third pick will be by Jacksonville Jaguars. They'll take outside linebacker Dante Fowler at the University of Florida. Number four pick by the Oakland Raiders, they'll take Amari Cooper out of Alabama. Number five pick, the Redskins will take outside linebacker Shane Ray. Number six, the New York Jets will take quarterback Marcus Mariota, University of Oregon. Number seven, the Chicago Bears will take wide receiver Kevin White from West Virginia University. Number eight, the Atlanta Falcons will take outside linebacker Vic Beasley, Clemson. Number nine, the New York Giants will select offensive tackle Brandon Sharif. And rounding out the top ten, we'll have the St. Louis Rams taking offensive tackle Linnell Collins out of, the, out of Louisiana State University. All right, guys, what do you think of my top ten? Um, I agree with you, actually, Kyle, for your first three picks. And then uh, it's actually after that that I start to kind of disagree. Um, I have Oakland taking Kevin White as opposed to Amari Cooper. Um, I think White kind of blows the top off of the lids of defenses, which when you look at Oakland's past draft history, it's really what they like to do. But that was under the Al Davis era, and I, I, I actually did some research into this. Oakland lately has been liking Amari Cooper better. That's why the Amari Cooper pit makes sense, and Amari Cooper finds better space. He's played with a bunch of subpar quarterbacks. Derek Carr is a little better than subpar, so I think he'll be better for them. But Kevin White's more physical, and that showed in the combine. He was very physical off his like passing routes. Agreed. And in the red zone, he's a fantastic player. He's very tall. Kevin White did it all Cooper, in yeah. West Virginia. Yeah. I mean, not that Cooper didn't in Bama. But Kevin White, I think, bring, has a lot more upside than Cooper. He can help does. a rookie quarterback much more than Cooper can his first couple years. Agreed. All right, so I, I left Raymond Gregory out of my top ten. What do you guys think of that? I think Randy Gregory is going to fall out of the top ten. Mm -hmm. He may even fall all the way to the Steelers at 22. Who knows? But, um, like I said, I agree with leaving him out. Uh, I think you're a little bit wrong on with Washington's pick, actually. I think, they have, I think Washington will take Vic Beasley instead of Shane Ray. I think Shane Ray's poor performance at his pro day – it's going to knock him down a couple pegs. He might get Teddy. I don't think he's going to get Teddy Bridgewater, mind you. But I think Washington's going to shy away from him. I think they like Vic Beasley a little bit more. I don't know why you don't like Vic Beasley. I think outside of Dante Fowler, he's the best pass rusher in this well, We're going to get to that in a second. Now, you were nodding your head about Randy Gregory. Tyler. I feel like Gregory, he was going to go number three, the Jaguars. The pot situation, bad combine. 
I feel like he'll fall down to number eight. Like a team that really needs that pass rusher for so many years, that's Atlanta. And they'll, they'll, they'll just ignore that pot situation. They'll mentor him, help him get better with that. It's a small problem. It's fixable. It's very fixable. Uh, so I feel Atlanta will definitely be able to pick him. Now, Tyler, I want to go back to the Vic Beasley thing. I actually love Vic Beasley, and I actually think he's the best defensive player in the draft. That's Even right. better than Leonard Williams. No. Yes. I don't know about is, all that. He is better than Vaughn than Von Miller was coming out of the draft, who he's compared to. But the reason I have him going after Shane Ray is because everyone loves Shane Ray. And they like Shane Ray for the pure fact that he has good pass rush numbers, even though he is only a one-year wonder. Well, again, the, though, he, he had a bad comp. He had a bad pro day. I, His combine wasn't great. I don't he, look at the combine stuff. I, I look at strictly tape. He only played the one side of the field. He has short arms and was not able to go against more physical tackles and longer arms. They were able to keep him out here. He wasn't able to get inside. Oh, yeah, and he's one dimensional. Vic Beasley, on the other hand. You made my better, case for me. <laughs> but know why, teams don't, know why teams don't like Vic Beasley? Because Vic Beasley isn't one dimensional. And listen, if, if you're Washington, you have Adam Carricker, who is the well rounded defensive end. You're looking for the one trick pony, which I love Brian Arakpo. That's really all he was after, after his rookie year. But I think that's what they're looking for. linebacker. I, th well, I still think you need to, I, I think if Washington was smart, I know this is Dan Snyder, so Washington and smart usually doesn't equal, but I think you definitely have to take Vic Beasley, which kind of mur muckies things up. I have Chicago taking Shane Ray, actually. Yeah, yes. I have Chicago, Shane Ray falling to Chicago. I think they kind of want another pass rusher, and why not Shane Ray in Chicago? I think that's a great I think, I think he's match a, with him and Jared Allen. I think he's the let, second most overrated defensive player. Well, I think Ray Allen, McGregor is one. Well, see, let Allen, Jared Allen, guy who was consistently one of the best pass rushers for a while in his prime, Jared Allen was one of the best pass rushers in the league. You can't argue that. Tw over 20 sacks, almost broke Strahan's record. So but I think you let – you kind of fall to, off, fall, fell off the wagon a little bit now. Yeah, well, now but, he's become a 3-4 three, three, outside linebacker, which he's never done. Well, exactly. And, again, another problem that Jared Allen's had is he had – right kind of keep going with different systems. All right. I, I want to ask you, Mr. Cahill, how does the draft get shook up if somebody trades up for the number two pick to take Mariota? Well, that kind of, I have the Jets to take Mariota six because they really need that quarterback. But then everything will, pass rushers will fall down, everything will shift. Uh, I feel like San Diego or uh, even New York, if they really feel like someone's going to make that presence for Mariota, they'll trade number two, even number three or four or five. Gets to, get, gets to get ahead of everyone else. All right. I want to ask you guys a question. Best first rounder outside the top ten and biggest bust candidate mm. in the first round, starting with you, Tyler. I think the best outside of the top ten is um, probably Marcus Peters. I really like him a lot. I think I like a lot what he's done in, Wa in Washington, right, I believe. And he's kind of just, I, I think, another one of those guys, another boomer bust candidate maybe. And he has a lot of potential, and I'm going to pass it over to Tyler. I like Gurley. Uh, I feel like the only reason he's out of the top ten is because he's a running back, because the running backs are dime a dozen this year, or every year, actually. And I feel like a, a boomer bust is probably going to be, I see a little Shea, or Ray. Is I, Ray. I, I agree. Shea Ray is, yeah. uh, Shane Ray is our biggest bust. Yeah. All right. My bust, I'm going Raymond Gregory. And my outside top ten players going to be Jalen Collins, cornerback, LSU. When we get back on, on the, for the case of the week, we'll be talking about what NFL player you'd like to build your team around. a purpose, has a dream to have their voices heard, no matter where they come from, no matter where they go. As an American, it is their right to have freedom of speech. I have a dream that one day this message will speak louder than words, that even the quietest voice will not go unnoticed. That is my dream. What is yours? For more information, visit www.freedomofspeechpsa.org.
it's time for the case of the week. We'll be debating which NFL player you'd build your team around. I'm joined by Trevor Sheets, Tyler Cahill, Blaine King. Trevor, lead us off. Well, the best play, one of the best quarterbacks in the league is also the guy I would try to uh, get my team to start off with, and that is Andrew Luck, quarterback of the Indianapolis Colts. I have Russell Wilson, two-time peering Super Bowl champ. And I'm going with the bad man himself, Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> the bad All man. right, so <laughs> why, why did you go with Aaron Rodgers? Because he is like the oldest old of the other two <laughs> yeah, players exactly. chosen. Well, I'm going with Aaron Rodgers. Well, one, Tyler took mine. I was going to go with Russell Wilson. But I'm going with Rodgers because on the simple fact that he's already a Super Bowl champion. He's one of the best quarterbacks in the league. He's mobile, got a great arm. There you go. You say mobile. No one's more mobile and more effective than Russell Wilson. Yeah, Almost rushing yeah. for 1,000 yards yeah. last season. Uh -huh. And he's not a smart runner. He's not going to go in and take that hit by a linebacker. He'll run Rodgers. And Luck might not be the most mobile quarterback in the world, but he, he can get downfield if need be. He's a big physical guy, so he's a lot harder to get down. Kind of slow. Yeah. Guys, hey, where's J.J. Wadden this debate? I mean, uh, there's exactly no one loving where he should be. Defensive, defensive player side. is never a player you want to no, start. Still very good player. He's a good, yeah, he's, he's a great good player. player. Best don't, defensive don't player. Wrong, but, but offense. You can't Doesn't start a team around defense. defense win championships? One player on the defense, defense. doesn't win defense. championships. Defense. 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 Together as a collective unit. Because the Texans are still Super Bowl. Yeah, how many rings does Wad have? How many rings does Ndamukong Sue have? How many guys, how many rings does Andrew Luck have? Zero, but he's still he's, he you, to, I'll give him this one. I'll can, give him this one. He'd got to go against Manning and Brady. You can do a playoff appearance. No, I now I want to ask you about Andrew Luck. Okay. I actually like Andrew Luck, but what do you make all the, what do you make all the turnovers Andrew Luck has? Because these other two guys seem to protect the ball a lot better than Andrew does. Luck has also hasn't had the best offensive line. He has rushed a little bit more, and also hasn't he has T, he had T Y Hilton, and that was really the only offensive weapon Reggie, he had last Reggie year. Wayne. This year, yeah, they, Reggie Wayne, Reggie Wayne, Akeem Nicks, yeah. Dwayne yeah. Allen, Kobe Fleener. Uh, Kobe Fleener, don't get me started Ahmad on Kobe Fleener. Mediocre at best, tight end. But uh -huh. but, but also he didn't have an offensive line until this year. In Seattle's offensive line, can, they can run block, pass blocking, and they have no wide receivers. They always dish out like they never have a consistent wide receiver. Your right. defense yeah, right exactly. Right, Legion of defense. Boom has helped yeah. Russell Wilson a lot more than any of the other defense. I'm not going to lie. My quarterback should have had a second ring this year, but things happen. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, all right. Uh, now, you talk about Russell Wilson. Everyone else has made their case. You're just kind of waiting the wings, Tyler. I want to hear what you got to say. Russell Wilson, he's, super, he's a very smart quarterback. He's not, he doesn't make that many turnovers. He doesn't make that many mistakes. Mm -hmm. He's a very – he controls the clock of the game, too. Yeah. And he, doesn't have, he hasn't had that wide receiver, that big wide receiver, like – like a Jimmy Graham yeah. this year, basically. Yeah, Randall Cobb, you have great tight ends. Yeah, yeah, big you guy. have Reggie Wayne, who can probably mentor, and it was the easiest transition from Peyton Manning onto Andrew Luck. But Russell Wilson. Uh, they had a little guy by the name of uh, Beast Mode in the backfield with Russell Wilson. That's a lot of security also, for a young quarterback. Also, what happened in the NFC Championship game? Yes, you did. Like, yes, Wilson did win it, but he did toss for five picks. But he also has, he has that Super Bowl and. The, the drive, though. That fourth, that overtime drive though. That's yeah. hey. Also, I mean, he had that. He had, one, uh, he had a bad game. One he had bad that pass. nice little pass there at the end of the Super Bowl as yeah, well. Yeah, that's the one bad pass. That but was a pretty was, big bad pass. That's a, yeah, that's it wasn't kinda, like it decided. That the game. sent me and him into celebration. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but I mean, I, I like all your picks. I mean, we made age a factor, and Blaine, you did take the oldest guy out of the group. He's thirty-one. That's he, old he's, at, he's at his prime, and he, yeah, guys, and he did sat for guys. like a few years, so he's. Still got more years to But go. his body, though, I mean. He led a team on a half a leg. Knee injuries. <laughs> he back beat injuries, the shoulder injuries. I mean, I his body's starting to do that Ben Roethlisberger thing. But he's going to be a break. tough quarterback. But, yeah, for the next, what, maybe two or three years, both of our guys seen, are going to be around yeah, for at least uh, the next they 10 years. Even, trying well, to okay. Vulnerable. All right, we're looking at Tom Brady. He's 38. Peyton's 39. Uh, okay. Aaron Rodgers, you say he has the same, and don't forget, he sat for a few years, so he still has some longevity. But he also That's gets a lot. All right, Blaine, all right, every, all right guys. He plays in a hard division. Final points for each. One quick point on, about each of your players, starting with Blaine. A Super Bowl. Russell. To, to a Super Bowl and a Super Bowl appearance last year. Young guy, strong guy, and has proved he can carry the team on his back. All right. Now it comes down to my say. I love all three players, and I'm a huge Aaron Rodgers fan. And going into this, I actually thought I was going to take Aaron Rodgers because he's a bad, bad man. But Trevor, but Tyler Cahill swayed my decision, and I'm taking Russell Wilson. Super Bowl winner, and, I mean, look That's what long. he's done. All right, that does it for, for the case of the week. So join us next week. The same Pioneer channel, the same Pioneer time, and, of course, the same Pioneer sideline. Bye, guys.